Well, good morning. It is great to be with you all. And um, I trust the Lord will have something for you. Being December, usually my uh, reading goes to the uh, start of the Gospels, the birth of Christ, because it's the month of Christmas. And so we're going to read this morning from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. And we're going to start at verse 5. Um, this will not be a Christmas message, but it is um, uh, from this introduction to uh, the birth of the Lord. And so we'll see what the Lord has. Trust there will be something for you. Uh, verse 5 of Luke 1 says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And this verse introduces us to um, the time and people that are going to be talked about. Um, both uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth were descendants of Aaron. You remember Aaron was Moses' older brother, and Aaron became the first high priest of Israel uh, during the um, uh, book of Exodus there. And uh, all the priests of Israel were the descendants of Aaron. And so Zacharias was, and we read that Elizabeth was also a descendant. It makes me think of the Lord Jesus. He's our great high priest. And everyone who is born of him, born again, is a priest. Uh, under his headship, uh, his high priesthood. And so we get this uh, picture of these. But notice it also includes Herod, who is uh, king of Judea. Well, he wasn't... Um, uh, even a, a whole Israelite, I don't know if he was partially uh, Jewish by birth or what, but um, he was the representative of the Roman rule. And so these people are uh, living uh, a life that they do not desire for themselves. It was the same back in the days of Aaron and Moses. You remember God had uh, raised up uh, a nation through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob became Israel from where the name comes. The 12 tribes are his 12 sons and so on. And it became a glorious nation in the land, not ruling the land, but in the land and prospering and uh, long story short, by the time we come to uh, Moses and Aaron's day, they are slaves in Egypt. It's a, 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 a great come down for God's people, it seems. But the one thing that is clear is that in Moses and Aaron's day, they were, they were longing to see their Savior come. Right from the beginning of creation, God had promised that uh, his son would come and be our savior. And so they were looking for this great salvation. And of course, you know the story. God raised up Moses and, and Israel was delivered from the slavery and bondage of, of uh, Egypt. And they came out uh, not as escaped slaves, but proud with their heads held high and, and um, uh, going back to their land and they were enriched and all the rest of that. It was quite a thing. And so with that great deliverance, they, they once again took up their place in the land, this time possessing it as their own land. And uh, they prospered. And in the days of, of David, the king, they, it was 
prosperous and a powerful nation. You know how uh, that was from the Old Testament. And, but then things declined again and they ended up in Babylonian captivity. And even though after Babylon, some were restored to the land, they never seemed to have that full possession and glory of it again as they had. And the domination by other countries continued up until the time of Elizabeth and, and Zacharias here. Uh, Rome was the dominating power and they were constantly in conflict between their own religion and culture and ways and, and uh, desires and that of the oppressive rule of Rome. And so as we open our Bible here, Zacharias and Elizabeth and the whole nation are longing for the coming of their savior. And they have the prophecies and the provisions that were revealed in the Old Testament that would lead them to expect that the time was at hand. Um, it sounds very similar to our day, doesn't it? Uh, the Lord Jesus came in as they had expected and uh, accomplished our salvation and the church was begun and what a glorious beginning they, it had. And um, well, that was 2000 years ago and, and it's still, uh, God's church and God's people today, but uh, uh, we seem to uh, be oppressed and afflicted. Well, God said we would, but certainly in an affluent country like Canada, uh, we, we seem to yield to that uh, domination. Uh, not saying we should take up rebellion, but what I mean is we, we almost fit in with it. And, uh, and yet we were talking at the break, uh, the brother was reminding us that the Lord is coming back and, and perhaps it's today. Now the question is, are, are, are we anticipating that? We know that, we believe that, it's a, a point of our teaching and, and our doctrinal stance and all that, but is our daily life lived in anticipation of the Lord's return. I think, I think if we really believed he was coming back today, uh, I think we would spend our day differently perhaps than we did yesterday or the past weeks and so on. But at any rate, there's a similarity between the three divisions of time and these different dispensations. And this story uh, begins with this uh, last minute longing and desire to be free from the oppression of the world of sin and, and uh, the slavery to it and be with the Lord. And so it goes on to say, verse six, uh, they were both righteous before God that's Zacharias and Elizabeth, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. That's a fantastic statement, isn't it? Uh, righteous before God and, and blameless in his sight. What a, what a couple they must be. They were believers. They were living their life of faith. But verse 7 says, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. There was something lacking in their life. Uh, you might call it fruitfulness or the ability to reproduce yourself. That is normal to every living thing, animal, vegetable, human, uh, or spiritual. Uh, life always reproduces itself and here's a godly couple living lives of faith but 
they are lacking uh, a family, a child. It was cause for um, uh, people to look sideways at them. Uh, we'll see that in a few moments. Uh, they, they thought that God was punishing barren couples for some wrong they had done. Now, that's not the case with with Zacharias and Elizabeth, or probably most that were barren, but it, that's what they thought. And so there is a, a, a lack there. And so it goes on, verse 8, so it was that while he, that Zacharias, was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. And we see um, Zacharias at his uh, daily responsibilities. The priesthood was divided into sections and each one had a period of time, I think it was about a week or maybe a bit more, in which they served at the, te the temple. And um, the rest of the year they served in priestly functions, but not in the service of the temple, you see. And in order that God would have his way, they left it up to him to choose who would um, do this work and this occasion the lot fell to Zacharias. God chose Zacharias to go into the temple as close as a man could go to the presence of God in that day and he would pray and burn incense and his prayer would rise up to God as a sweet smelling savor and then verse 9 said that the people were outside. Uh, they were not priests. They could not go into that uh, holy place that Zacharias was in, but they were outside praying. And I think this is a beautiful picture, too. Our Lord Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. He is in the immediate presence of God, and he's interceding for us. And his intercession is a sweet-smelling savor to God, isn't it? And consequently, we can pray. And, and God hears our prayers and answers our prayers because we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that so? And, and so we have this, this similarity uh, between now and in those days. Um, the difference being we have boldness to come right into the presence of God. Zacharias couldn't do that. There is a heavy uh, veil curtain separating between him and the presence of God for his own protection. But anyway, this is what he was doing. And then we come to the uh, the heart of this thought, it says in verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Now here's Zacharias, he's praying to God and, and, and God's going to answer his prayer in a, a very direct way. And so he sends this angel. Now, now I'm not sure that any of us could ever say they have encountered an angel quite in, in such an immediate way. And uh, it must have been quite a thing. And here's Zacharias, a godly man, and he's filled with fear. That is pretty normal if, as you read your Bible, whether it's an angel or whether it's the Lord himself, uh, people were struck through with, with fear. They're, they're in a, a presence greater than they could ever imagine. 
until it happened. And so Zacharias is afraid. But, but God doesn't speak to us in order to strike us through with fear. And so it says in verse 11, uh, the, then uh, verse uh, 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias. And he takes away his fear, uh, lifts him up to a, a, a place of, of communication together. I think that's tremendous. Uh, that happens constantly. And I, I just think of John on the Isle of Patmos when the ascended Lord Jesus appeared to him and, and John fell on his face as dead. But the Lord immediately uh, picked him up. Don't be afraid, you know, and, and I got something to say to you. Well, God has something to say to Zacharias here. And so the first thing he does is, is takes away this, this uh, sense of, of overwhelming uh, glory and greatness and so that he can hear this word. And so the angel said, don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. You see, he was praying. Now, he was not praying for a son. He was not praying because Elizabeth was barren. Uh, we'll see that in a moment, but um, they were long past any expectation of a, of a child, but he, they were praying for this promised Savior to come and to lead them out of the um, oppression of their lives. And so uh, the angel says, your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Uh, because he's heard the prayer, you're going to have a son. And you know, and I know, because we've read this story before, that their son, John, would be the forerunner to announce the Christ. And uh, what a thing. Uh, Zacharias had no idea that he would be the one to father um, this forerunner. And in fact, he'd have no expectation of it because of his circumstances. So the, the prayer was for the coming savior. And, um, and the answer was, you're going to have a son. And you'll call his name John. John means um, uh, God is gracious. And then it says, and you'll have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. <clears throat> the joy and gladness that he's going to have would be um, one that would be shared by all the people. The joy and gladness of of the Savior come, uh, of the salvation accomplished, and so on. Uh, but Zacharias doesn't understand all that right now, but we do. And um, so it is. Um, where am I now? Uh, everyone's going to rejoice with you in this. Verse 15, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. If Zacharias and Elizabeth are an impressive couple, righteous in the sight of God and so on, um, let, their son's going to far outstrip them on that. Great in the sight of the Lord. Uh, Zacharias wasn't called great in the sight of the Lord. Uh, filled with the spirit right from the womb. And he's going to be the forerunner. Turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And, and so he makes that a little more clear in verse 17. 
he will also go before him, that's the Lord their God, verse 16, uh, John will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, and then he quotes from um, Malachi to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The Lord is coming. The, the forerunner is going to be your son who will announce him and prepare the people for it. it what a fantastic answer to Zacharias's prayer. Um, we pray, don't we? And um, uh, we sometimes wonder if God hears, but he does. And we sometimes wonder if he answers. Uh, and if we get a bare bones answer of the precise thing we're asking, we think we're doing well. Well, I wonder how long and often Zacharias did pray for a son in his younger years. But God withheld it, not because he didn't want him to have a son, but because he wanted them to have this son. And, and God's ways are always greater and always better than what we think that he should do for us at any given time. And so the, here's this, this great blessing of God for all the people uh, given through a godly priest who was faithful in his duties and all the rest. And he proclaims it to him. And, and this would just seem to keep getting better and better. It's just that we have to now read verse 18 and, and the whole thing falls apart. It says, and Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? He didn't believe it. He's a believer and he didn't believe God. You ever do that? Um, why didn't he believe him? Yeah. Why did he need some proof? Uh, how shall I know this? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 said that the Jews seek a sign and the Greeks wisdom. Well, Zacharias wants a sign. He wants some reason to believe it. And uh, uh, well, we live in a day where some of the people I'm talking about people generally, not confined to, to believers, but true also of believers. Some need signs and, and exciting things to happen in order to think their life with the Lord is valid or, or whatever. I don't know. Probably the majority are more like the Greeks who want wisdom, and you might um, um, find you can go into any Christian bookstore and, and you'll find a ton of books that'll give you a lot of Christian wisdom uh, how, how, how to have a happy marriage, how to overcome your anger, how to. Um, how to evangelize, how to build the church, and, and, and it's all about us and, and uh, uh, wisdom that if only we can understand it right, we can do it right. But, uh, but God doesn't work that way, does he? And so uh, Zacharias is on shaky ground here. How shall I know this? The reason he doesn't believe, he tells us in the next words, he says, for I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Now, uh, we, we can understand that easily, can't we? It's not just that Elizabeth was barren, that would be a, a great enough hurdle. But now 
Uh, they're both beyond the years of childbearing. They, they had given up any expectation or hope of a child, and it, it would be humanly impossible. It would be physically impossible for them uh, to, according to any understanding or any knowledge that they had, to bear a son. So how could he believe it? And maybe sometimes when you're reading the scripture or when you're praying or, or whatever with other believers and talking and, and maybe the Lord puts something on your heart. Maybe he speaks to you. Maybe he gives you the idea that you should do something but then you brush it aside because, well, I couldn't do that. Well, it's clear Zacharias and Elizabeth can't have a baby. That it's a physical human impossibility. And um, so he does not believe. But I love the answer to that. Verse 19, the angel answered, and said to him, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. Now, don't miss this. This is really good. Verse 18, Zacharias says, I am an old man. Verse 19, the angel says, I am Gabriel, a mighty man of God, <laughs> or a great, mighty, mighty in the might of God. Um, it's, it's an important truth. Uh, God's not asking Zacharias to do something that he can do naturally. And neither does he ask us to do those things. A anything the Lord has to do is his work. You remember the Lord Jesus came to do his father's will. And he did his father's will at every point. But God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are higher above ours than the heavens are above the earth. And, and he, he, when he asks us to do something, um, we may feel inadequate. We will feel inadequate. But if we believe him, we can step out in faith and do whatever he tells us to do. At least we can, we can go through the motions and uh, because he has asked us to do it, he'll be the one to make it fruitful, to make it come to pass, to make it bear the benefit and the good of it. Um, uh, let me ask you something. Are you a believer? Do we believe God? As believers, <laughs> um, Zacharias was a lovely believer, and he was faithful in everything he knew to do. But when God come and spoke to him and, and asked him to do something beyond his natural abilities, well, he needs to learn to get his eyes off himself and on to God. I'm an old man. Yeah, but I'm God's mighty man. Gabriel says, wonderful, uh, who stands in the presence of God. Zacharias couldn't even stand in the presence of God, but, but Gabriel could. He's much more powerful, and, uh, and that God in whose presence he stands, to whom Zacharias was praying, sent him to bring this message, this is God's word for him. His word is powerful. It's living. Living things reproduce themselves. And uh, here is a, a, a word that God has spoken to him and, and he did not believe. And so... Uh, uh, the angel goes on. Before we do that, let me say this. One of the 
important things that's not obvious in this whole situation of Zacharias's unbelief. And I think it's important. And I'll just mention it now. And we might talk a little bit about it again next week. I'm not sure. But um, it is this, that all the people are waiting for the Savior. They're waiting for that salvation. Uh, but what is that salvation? It, it's a supernatural work. It, it's a... Um, let me say it this way, it's a miracle. We can't save ourselves. No great human being born of natural birth could save him, his own self, let alone anybody else. Um, and, and so God's salvation, our redemption, even the bare bones of it, let alone all the fullness of it, is a supernatural work of God that he does in normal human lives that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, if our salvation if our relationship with God, if our um, living as God's people, as Zacharias and Elizabeth were doing in their day, is a, a, a supernatural work of grace, why would we stop believing when he asks us to do something that we can't do? The whole of our spiritual life is spiritual, supernatural, miraculous, if you will, and not miraculous in the sense of seeking a sign, uh, of doing things to prove things, no. But um, we have a, 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 an eternal life in Jesus Christ, don't we? And so uh, Gabriel essentially says, get your eyes off yourself and look back at the Lord and his word. His word, by the way, is the Lord Jesus. We were reminded of that earlier at the end of the breaking of bread. And so Zacharias goes on to say, verse 20, but behold, I really like that. I look for that word behold in, in these days when I'm reading his word. It means look and see. You would expect him to say, but listen. God has sent me to tell you something. Listen. No, he doesn't say that. He says, God has sent me to tell you something. So look and see. God's word, whether you think of it as the Lord Jesus, the word of God, or whether you think, think of it as the Bible, the written word is light by which we can see. And that all what matters is that we see things as God shows them to us, not as we know them naturally on this earth. And when he says do something, we can do that. And so uh, uh, the angel says, behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. God has spoken. It will be done. But he will not have a spokesman who speaks in unbelief. We oftentimes speak of, of Christian things and biblical things from, from uh, wisdom, from knowledge, from this, rather than by faith in the Lord. But... Um, John was not allowed to speak this. It would not be a living word. It would not be spoken in faith. And so he was, he was made 
unable to speak until the son was born. And notice verse 21, it says, and the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. This whole thing was unusual. It's interesting, isn't it? We're no different from them. They go to the temple. We, we come to meeting at, at, in our assemblies and, and we have grown over the years to know the, the process and, and what's gonna happen and what time it's gonna start and what time it's gonna end. And you know, the fact is the day after the rapture, the churches will still be filled on this earth and pe people doing the routine, <laughs> not believers. But um, when God is doing a work, well, Zacharias isn't gonna be the one to say, oh, sorry, time's up. The people out front, they know something's up because this is not normal. Wouldn't it be great if, if occasionally in our meetings, uh, we had such a sense of the Lord's presence? And I loved what the brother said this morning about the Lord being present. And I believe that with all my heart. Wouldn't it be great if his presence was such on some mornings that it was, was a little bit unusual and maybe took us a bit longer. Oh, we can't do that. I got to get home for lunch. Well, anyway, um, Today it will be <laughs> the, the, um, so the people were surprised at this and um, uh, verse 22, when he came out, he could not speak to them and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple for he beckoned them and remained speechless. They knew something was up. And so it was, verse 23, as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and she hid herself five months saying, thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among the people. That was that reproach for being barren. Now drop your eye down to verse 57, please. Verse 57. Um, it's uh, Elizabeth's full time came. She delivered, brought forth a son. Verse 58, her neighbors and relatives heard and they rejoiced with her. Verse 59, on the eighth day, they took him to be circumcised and they, the people, would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. That was important in those days, carry on the father's name. But they said to her, or her mother answered and said, no, he shall be called John. But they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who is called by this name. And so they made signs to the father that what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote saying his name is John. So they all marveled and immediately his Zechariah's mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke praising God. Now, this is great, isn't it? He's a, a godly man. He's faithful in his service. God speaks to him. He doesn't believe it, but God's work is going to be done, and his word will happen just as he spoke it. But Zacharias uh, couldn't have any part in speaking that. And now when it comes to pass, Zacharias' mouth is open. And what does he say? Oh, I'm such a wretched believer, I should have believed. Oh man, I'm not worthy. No, he didn't say that, he praised God. He praised God. Just as when he was afraid in the temple, the, 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 the angel said, don't be afraid. Lift them out of that fear. God does not want us to wallow in our failures and and think, well, you know, I got to leave it to other people. Much of the formality 
that encompasses churches today and much of the limited participation by a few experts comes from that very thing. Men and women like Zacharias, they, they first of all say, I can't do that. And then they don't do that. And, and, and then they feel, oh, I'm, I'm unworthy. I haven't been faithful. And, and, and so we'll leave it to the experts. God never deals with us that way. And, and uh, Zacharias, first thing he does is praises God. And then fear came on all who dwelt around them. <laughs> they, they, they could see that Zacharias is being dealt with by God here, just like Zacharias saw the angel come from God. And all these things were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea and all those who heard them kept them in their hearts saying, what kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And it goes on to Zechariah's prophecy, far too detailed to enter into, but the babe is born, he is named and all the people's attention is drawn to that babe and the name it's not the name they had expected they are now watching john well he's just just a babe but they are anticipating they know and zacharias at this point is able to speak and tell them they know that uh, at least Zacharias believes this is, his son is the forerunner and he's going to introduce the Christ. I think that's lovely. God always tells ahead of time what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. And he enables us to anticipate it and keep looking for it and even have our part in it. And so those are my thoughts that came from this chapter. Our, our new life in Christ is, is a miracle. It's spiritual life. It's not something we can do, but God asks us to live it. We can do that by faith, can't we? And God will do everything he wants to do in us and through us and that to his own glory. Father, we bow in your presence. We lift our hearts again, and, and we ask that uh, you might be glorified in our lives. We know that your will, and we desire that too. Father, help us when our flesh cries out against us and tells us these things cannot be. Um, give us the, the courage to stand and speak out when you would have us to do that, whether it's um, uh, ministering to one another as believers or whether it's uh, reaching out to the lost. Give us the, uh, the courage to realize that, that uh, it's not dependent on our abilities. It's you that's doing a great and eternal work. And so we